The Lord be with you, everyone. And I want to come to a new beatitude tonight. It's almost at the end of the list. It's in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And again, the word that we only commented on at the beginning, that word blessed, meaning a, a supreme gladness of heart, a joy that is the envy of everyone that sees you. And it's applied here to peacemakers, for such are known to be the sons of God. Okay, uh, this, this word that is used here, peace, before I can be a peacemaker, uh, and that word describes something creative, a, a workmanship. It, it is a working at bringing peace. Well, if I do not know what peace is, and if I do not have peace, then it's impossible to be a peacemaker. And therefore, we have to step back a moment from this verse and ask the question, what is peace? And also to recognize that peace, as we shall see in a moment, is not natural to the human outside of Christ. It's, it had to be made, and so Jesus is the original peacemaker. But I'll leave that for a moment. Enough is this word peace that I say again does not belong naturally to the human. It's, it's a word that belongs exclusively to God. He is the God of peace. And whenever that word is used to describe a working peace within us, it calls it the peace of God. Big, big phrase, the peace of God, God's own peace, actually given into us. And it adds in Philippians, the peace of God that passes human comprehension. Of course it would. It is that which is natural to the Holy Trinity, but not natural to mankind, this side of the fall. And so I want to take a good, long look, without rushing it, at this word peace and how it all fits in to our being able to know peace and walk in peace. So let, let me say it like this, the essence of the lie. And when I say the lie, um, there are some parts of Christianity that would call that the fall or original sin. I call it the lie. It is that most ancient sin that came into the human race by the words of the liar, which is one of the biblical names for Satan. And he, in saying the lie, brought about a new world, a new world which was the world of death and the opposite of peace. There can be no peace in the world of Satan. It is impossible. Where the lie was accepted, there peace could not be. For I say yet again, it is exclusively the possession of God, and only those who are united to him know his peace. And so when sin came in, when the lie was infused into the human race, and when Adam believed the lie, another world came into being where peace did not happen. Okay, what is peace that was lost when the liar injected his lie into the very heart of the human race? Peace. Some of you might know it as that Old Testament word shalom. Um, and actually, our word peace that we use in conversation 
And, well, the word peace as it is used by humans today is really not what this word is talking about. This word is far beyond uh, merely the absence of war. And actually, that's about where most people are today. Peace means the absence of war. Or, or you, you get in those um, TV shows where people are asked, you know, well, what is your greatest desire? And they look angelic and say, uh, peace for the world. And everybody claps, you know. Uh, that, that's a marvelous idea, I suppose. But all they mean is the absence of war. And anyway, peace for the world is just really a... Yeah, I, I've got to have peace in me before I can think of the world. And, and I, I've got to seek to bring peace to my neighbor. And I've got to live in peace with all those that fill my world. Then we'll get to talking about peace for the world. No, th this peace that is described in the scripture, I say again, is far beyond that. So let me try to reduce it to its smallest definition, because we could really fill the hour with it. But number one, uh, this word shalom, peace, describes union, the coming together and the fitting together uh, of, of two or, or more. Um, I, I tell you, um, my, my father was a carpenter. I, I'm not by any means, but I, I watched as he would make things and he would make uh, two to come together and join together with, without nails or screws. A and he called it dovetailing. It was where this piece of wood fits perfectly into this piece of wood, and it's it, there, there it is. It's, it's stable and solid, and it's going to be there. A union has taken place. The, the, there's a dovetailing of the two together. Well, that would be described by the word shalom. The bringing together, dovetailing, so that those live together seamlessly. They fit together without any hurt or pain. Okay, then it, the second thing I would say is, is that shalom means harmony. In fact, it has been used to describe melody. Um, you know, the, the melody of a song. It's been used to describe a dance, that, that, that harmony where everything is fitting together and, and the result is the sweetest sound. That, that, and as, as you hear the sound, the very energy of the sound reaches into you, that harmony. Or translate that harmony into persons living in close quarters and, and they fit together. And there's the melody of that kind of expression of love. And, and their life is a beautiful going forth of the energy of shalom, harmony. And, and so the word uh, means reconciliation. And that, that's the bringing of two parties together. And I suppose you could sum this part of its definition as covenant friendship. And covenant means I am with you, I stand with you, I stand in you, even unto death you can trust me. That, that's, that's harmony, covenant friendship. Well, that, that's what they meant when they said shalom. You, you could also go to a third understanding of it. I, I, I hope you're seeing how really all these definitions fit together as one great big idea. Um, and, and this third one, it, it means wholeness. When, when a person would speak of being healthy, they could say shalom. Do you remember when Jesus healed that woman who came through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment? And you remember that story? Do you remember the words Jesus said after she was healed and after he had coaxed her story, and he's now about to let her go back to her life. He said, 
and I believe it's Mark's gospel where, where it comes out, he says, go into peace. That is your whole life, put it this way, your, your body, its organs, the very atoms of your body have all been disjointed. There's been no harmony. They have not worked together as the blueprint of the Creator intended. And therefore, healing of our body and living in health in our entire person could be described as shalom. I, I am made whole. I live in health because everything's in sync with the blueprint of the Creator. And therefore, that harmony, my body's organs dovetail together as they were intended to. And that includes uh, our mind. Uh, our mind is not going crazy. Our mind is not going here, there, and everywhere, all over the place, like a, a, a try, trying to herd a bunch of cats. It, it, it's uh, our, our mind is in sync. There is peace, peace in our mind, in our outlook on life. Our outlook on life is in sync with the Creator. And so we know the Creator's peace concerning what we see. And emotions, our emotions can go up and down. Um, it's, it's, it's worse than some of those uh, things that go screaming down through the, you know, cyclones, do they call them? I don't know. Where, where you get in a little car and you're carried to heights to be dropped down immediately and uh, and that, that's emotions. Dear Lord, you can be high one minute and low the next. You're all over the place because, you see, our idea of peace, peace since the fall of man, peace since the lie, is that I have peace as long as everybody out there is where I want them to be. You see, if everyone's smiling at me and doing nice things and there's no war, you see, no, no one's against me, then I have peace. Well, of course, you're going up and down because the person who's smiling at you right now, give them five minutes and they'll be mad with you. And, and, and circumstances are like the, the springtime sun and then suddenly it changes and your circumstances are like a hurricane around you. It's up and down. Well, if that's where you get your peace, no wonder you don't know what peace is, you see. Th this is health. Do you understand? Health, wholeness. Health and wholeness isn't just a matter of your body. You see, is that some people, you go to a doctor and he, he treats you like a piece of meat. He prods you and discusses your, your piece of meat and, and, and tries to fill you full of drugs to make it look like peace. But no, I'm a whole person. It's my core, my spirit. I know peace in my spirit with God. And, and therefore, I know peace in my mind. I know peace in my emotions, which means canceling out anxiety. Peace then in body, where the organs of my body all fit together as God intended, which brings peace into all that I do in my work, my possessions. That, that's shalom. And... and um, well, you could say, this is number four, I suppose, we're tranquility of heart and mind. I really uh, address that in, in the last uh, sentence, a tranquility of heart. Or could I say that sense of well-being? That's a hard one to really put into words. But when you have it, you know it. That, that sense, that heart well-being. It's saying, all is well with my soul. All is well, and I look out in life, and I know that I live and move in God, and therefore all is well. There's a tranquility. There's a peace. Whatever's happening around you, there within you is like a tranquil lake. That, that's, that's shalom. Or I suppose you could say at that point, um, shalom means that sense of safety, which, which is not denial. You are safe because you know that he who is the I am is your refuge. The I am is a shield around you. 
And in that tranquility, you live in the tranquility of the Holy Trinity. And then uh, number five, which could sound a bit disjointed from what I'm saying, but the meaning of shalom is abundance. That, that really is what happens to the person who is in shalom. It's, it's abundance because shalom doesn't stay inside you. Shalom, this, this harmony, this peace, it comes out in your words, it comes out in your hands, and, and it produces abundance because it arises from a mind that thinks and imagines abundance. You see, without peace, remember what I said, you're disjointed. That nothing fits, and therefore you have some weird thoughts. And, and those thoughts usually amount to saying, I am not enough. I don't have enough. I won't have enough. It's always negative, and it's attached to this enough. E enough for this, enough for that. Well, I won't have enough. A and many persons that are worth a lot of money on paper really are driven by this terrible negative that they will not have enough, and therefore they never stop grabbing as much as they can in case they won't have enough. It's the negative, and that negative gets into everything. Negative is, is straight out of the mouth of the liar, for God says he is the I am the enough, and the lie twists it back on me and says you are not enough, you're not good enough. You're not well enough. You're not enough. And no, shalom means I'm at peace in all the ways I've just described, which means I, I have an abundance in terms of my outlook on life. I have an abundance in terms of thinking of who I am in Christ. And so from abundance, the word shalom means prosperity, which I think by now you'll realize that doesn't mean just being a fat cat. Um, prosperity in the Bible has nothing to do with money to begin with. Prosperity is everything I've just said. Prosperity is I have a prosperous spirit in my walk and knowledge of God. I have a prosperous mind that is enlightened by the Holy Spirit to think creative thoughts and thoughts of the positiveness of the God who is always I am prosperous in emotions because we live in the joy of the Lord. And then, of course, out of that comes the word success. And we're, we're successful human beings made in the image of God. Okay, okay that's, that's about as quick a definition of shalom that I can give. And we'll refer to it as these, uh, looking at this goes by. It's a and God is described as the God of peace. He's the God of shalom. So it means that this that I've just described originates within God. That is, if I can understand the Holy Trinity, then maybe I've just said it. The Holy Trinity is this supreme, this limitless, this infinite peace in that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit fit together. Uh, the Bible says uh, he's in the Father. The Father's in Jesus and in the Spirit. And, and that, that's shalom, the, the fitting together. So the Father isn't the Son and the Son isn't the Father, yet they fit together as one, even as the Spirit is not the Father or the Son, but fits together. And so the Father is not God without the Son, and the Son is not God without the Father and the Spirit, and so on. Union. It's, it's, and, and within God is tranquility. There's no anxiety in God. Do you realize anxiety is a word that had to describe how humans felt after they had disconnected from God? So, that, that's a, a word that arises out of, of, of sin and union with the darkness. There is no anxiety in God. There's no worry in God. Those words are not even known. They're not part of the God vocabulary. No, the, the union, the peace, the tranquility, the, the 
ultimate, limitless well-being and, and limitless friendship which goes beyond all that we can ever understand in that, I, I don't know how when we say Holy Trinity what you think of. Many people think of God the Father with a long beard and Jesus looking like a carpenter and the Holy Spirit, the gray ghost. No, the <laughs> Father and Son and Holy Spirit, limitless person, and, and, and th there is a, what would be the word, camarade. It, it is that, huh, it is that sense of safety, that sense of ultimate friendship, that sense of being the one for the other, and the sense of drawing life the one from the other, being there the one for the other. God is the God of peace. And he is the God who, with whom all things are possible. Huh. And, and the God who is thus all in all chose to create and, and to create in and through the Son, the one we know as Lord Jesus Christ. And he created a universe of peace. Ever thought of it like that? But you see, everything in the original universe fitted together perfectly. Everything was in its right place. Everything was there for the other harmony and abundance. Read Genesis 1 and 2 as it describes the abundance of growth and life and beauty. And it says that Jesus, Colossians 1.15 says that not only did Jesus create, he be in the original word, but also in him all things consist, which means hold together. And so he's the holder together of the peace universe that he made. And of course, the peak of creation was you and I, that is, the human with the, the, the name Adam, and Adam means the human, and, and so Adam, he was created. And of course, you in Adam, you were created to live in this union, this shalom with the Creator. We, we were not like the rest of creation that were made reflecting the goodness and the wisdom and the kindness of God. We were different. There's a Grand Canyon stretched to limitless between us and the closest ape. We were made in the image and likeness of God. We were made to be those in whom God lived his peace and we lived in him in his peace. We, we were created to re derive life Life of spirit and mind, emotions and body, life, derive it, receive it from him, which would be peace. And, and that was to be our world, doing our work, finding and discovering our world, but all within the harmony and the peace of God and human dancing together peace, seeing God's Word as God knows it, absolute, final truth, so that peace is rooted and grounded in the truth, the blazing light of who God is, and because of who God is, then the, who I am and the meaning of life is grounded in that. The, the, the peace of God is the very life, pulsating life of God. And we were created to live in the participation of that life and this, I'll say, unearthly peace, because it's a peace that is of God, originates in and out from God. I can't find it in my relationships with other humans. And, and so, um, we were in that state, in the Garden of Eden. That, that's the Garden of Eden in every way. Um, and then enter the liar and, and Satan. And I say this as much as I can because 
Uh, I want you to get it that Satan is an untranslated word. It means the accuser. And in his accusations, he's a liar. And all these are biblical names given to this creature. He's the devil, which is another untranslated word, meaning the divider, the separator. And his lie was presented as an alternate reality. But there's no such thing. There's only one truth. And that truth is the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And therefore, he didn't present an alternate reality. He presented a hideous fantasy, a, a terrible illusion of the darkness that was the direct what call, and that's putting it mildly, it was uh, the, the drawing call to depart from the truth and believe the fantasy, the illusion, or to believe that which was not there. For well, that's what a lie is. It was. The lie was that humankind was to cut ties with the only source of life and peace. That, that, that's, that was it. it. It was a call, we could say, to independence. It was the call that is no longer derive your life from him who is the source of life. Well, what does that leave you with? Unlife, not life. And I want you to understand this. That being the case, well, what's going to happen? Well, the creature that depends depends upon the life of the Creator and is held together by the Creator. If that creature self-divorces and, and, and departs, cuts ties, to join ties with the great illusionist, the great liar, in whom is death, then to do what the lie pointed to would be to sink back into the nothingness from which love had called them in the word of creation. See, please, please don't, don't, the idea that Satan gives another lie is that, you know, this is an alternate reality, and therefore if you leave God, well, then you and I together can go off and have this marvelous other life, other reality. No, that's all part of the lie. There's only one life, there's only one reality, there's only one shalom. And therefore, to cut ties with it means I don't have an independent existence. My very existence hangs upon his word. And therefore, mankind would sink back into unbeing. I'll just put that on hold. The first expression of this uniting with the lie was the immediate departure of peace. You just stand back and look at what was happening and you see the you know, tearing fig leaves off to make the first clumsy sort of clothes. Why would they do that? To hide from each other. The absence of peace, you see, suddenly they're out of sync, even with each other, and it's hardly started yet. It was a new world of fear. They had to make up new words to describe these hideous tsunamis that were going through them. Fear, anxiety, shame. And they're hiding behind the fig leaves, masking even to each other who they are. And then they're going to mask and hide in the bushes away from God. They, they have entered into the world that is, is an expression of the liar. His other name is deceiver, the accuser, the divider, the murderer, the thief. Well, that's how the world is going to be. That's the one they have now covenanted to be friends with and receive the life of. And that's replaced the peace that is the atmosphere of God with us. In fact, let me put this, uh, it's just a, I suppose, well, I'll say it, the, the creation was dissed. You might have heard that word from your kids. 
um, well, a few things changed, but it was a fad a little while ago. They dissed one another. That, that's terrible. The, the word diss, you can find this in Webster's Dictionary, by the way, or the Oxford Dictionary, if you are listening in the UK. Um, the word dis is a very ancient word for devil or Satan or Lord of the underworld, Lord of the darkness, Lord of the chaos, destruction, collapse, and everything that the darkness brings, dis. Well, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because it came right into our language. And we talk about disobey. What does that mean? Well, it means that all obedience has collapsed and been shattered. That's what disobey means. Disjointed. It means everything's out of joint. Disrespect. It means there's come a terrible uh, falling apart between you and another, and there's no more respect or disregard. I, I put a person down. I'm out of sync, and our relationship is all over the place. What's a disappoint? It means that an appointment in life that I had is no longer. It's been thrown to pieces. Disbelief means what I once believed has now collapsed in my brain. Disagree, the breaking apart of a union. Disintegrate, when my very center is falling apart. Disinterest, when I'm so distracted by the darkness, I, I can't concentrate and... No, I just threw that in. But that's what happened, you see. De death meant that the human was totally out of sync with the only life. And in a state of disharmony, in the total person, which meant there was no more peace. Man has joined the liar against God, and so against the only life. And so I say again, he's doomed. Or as the Lord had warned him so carefully, that if you follow that path, you shall surely die. Surely die is our English way of saying what in the Hebrew it says, in dying you shall die. Collapse into the dust, return to the nothingness from which the word of God had called him into being. Yes. But something happens that befuddles the mind of logic. Because when this terrified, confused, and disjointed, disintegrating couple stand before God in the presence of their new master, Satan, God doesn't cut him off. Now, you see, I was raised to believe that when mankind sinned, God got mad. But then I read the Bible and found that's not true. Instead of them descending into the darkness and nothingness from which they came, they don't. God does not cut him off. Adam... The human has cut off ties with God, but God didn't cut off ties with him. See, that's where the love of God gets exasperating, because God doesn't love you because you do the right thing. He doesn't love you because you obey him. He loves you because he is God. And our little pipsqueak no to him can't stop him loving us. And the amazing thing, that you should stop and meditate for a week, that God did not cut him off. The, the, the fearful couple are in the presence of God, but they discover his love that does not abandon them, does not join with them in their divorcing him. But he stood with them. <laughs> this is ridiculous. They're not standing with him, but he stands with them against Satan, the accuser, the liar, and promises them the very first promise of Scripture 
that he personally will deal with the serpent liar and crush his head and restore to them which was lost. That's amazing. And that promise was fulfilled in the incarnation when God the Son, yes, that one who spoke the word in Genesis 1, that God the Son, who is the glue of all creation and holds the very atoms of our body together, that God the Son, who, remember, is one with the Father, and therefore the Father sends the Son, and remember, the Holy Spirit is one with the Father and Son, and therefore the Holy Spirit brings it about. And God the Son took to himself our humanity. And there you've got another dovetail, because God the Son did not turn into a human being, nor did a human being turn into God. Rather, he took to himself in a perfect union our humanity so that all of God would be lived out through the human. And why does he come? I mean, I have to ask that question. He didn't need to come. I mean, believe me, God has no need to become a human in this sense. The only reason that he is here, the only reason, the only reason he is here is to restore you and I to relationship and union with the Father and to bring about a new world of shalom and peace. And that's what the angels sang. Forget all the nonsense of Christmas and listen to what the angels said. Luke 2.10, it says, the angels said to the shepherds, do not be afraid, which is the first expression of no peace. Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which is the first expression of peace. And he said it's for everybody, every human being. And he was born in the city of David the Savior who is Christ the Lord. And, and, and you'll find this babe lying in a manger. And then suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men. And he says, For God is pleased with mankind. Wow. This is what the ancient prophet Isaiah spoke of 700 years before in Isaiah 9. It says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Why? For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. Did you hear that? A child will be born. That is, the humanity will, that he assumed to himself will be so authentic that he will be born through the birth canal of the Virgin Mary. But at the same time, a child born, that child born is also the Son of God that can never be born, but is the gift of God to us. God gave us the gift of God. God comes and, and joins himself to us. And he says, the government will rest on his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful, the Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, or the one who leads us into peace. This is why he's here. No, this is the... Um, this is, the love of God refused to let Adam and Eve go. He refused to let them follow the path of independence and return to nothingness. He would not assign to them the death, but rather chose, God love chose to 
take our place. Come and join our family as an authentic brother. And then to take our sin and death upon himself. This is, this is the gospel. It's all about us. And it's all about the glory of God in his relationship to us. I said he's authentic human. He's, he, he's not a pretend human. He's not playing in some sort of charade. He's not God with a mask on. He joined us so that he would experience and truly experience life as we know it. He would look at life through our eyes, which meant every kind of temptation that arises in every kind of experience. And all those temptations go back to that original one in the Garden of Eden. And in every temptation, he who is God, but through human mind and human emotion, through human flesh, he chooses to believe his Father. Which means that now into the human race has come a new kind of human that says no to Satan by saying one enormous yes to the Father. He refused. Jesus refused to be the original Adam. And so he is becoming, in fact, another Adam, another beginner of another kind of human race. He's the last Adam, says the New Testament. And he became the new road of union with the Father. He's the perfect servant of God that all humans were created to be. But he's the first human to live in the earth and dwell in that same micro moment in union and in the peace of God. And then this one takes the entire human race, feel his hands reaching to you, you see, he could, because, let me say it again, he, this one, is the creator. He's, he's the one that holds the whole jolly thing together. Or Hebrews 1 says he upholds it all by the word of his power. So therefore, your atoms hold together by the word of Jesus the creator. So he has the right, he has, shall I say, the ability, the worthiness to reach to us right into us and take us with all our sin and shame and anxiety and fear and dissing. All our life has been dissed, but he takes it and makes it his own. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5 says he became our sin. He totally stood instead of us. And what's he going to do with that? Well, there are some parts of the church that say then God the Father raged at him, beat him, damned him. Oh, come on. Have you ever, have you ever understood the Holy Trinity? There is no division in the Trinity. <laughs> and is that the kind of monster God that you worship? No, he carried our sin. What? And he entered into the death that was not given to the original Adam and therefore to the race. He went into our death. He went and carried our sin into death, our shame into death, our whole disjointed, broken persons. He carried us into death and he laid us in himself. He became the human race, and he carried us to death, and he laid the human race in the tomb. We're dead. Dead? That means it's over. It's done. Satan can't touch the dead. I mean, you can't be tempted after you're dead. You're dead. It's over. God says, I, I'm going to finish this. I'm not going to 
get, give the world a, a new law and say, if you do this and if you do that, then no, it's too late. You're going to die and that will be the end of it. Isn't it marvelous? It, and I mean that. I'm not being sarcastic. Isn't it marvelous? Your life of shame and sin and guilt was carried into genuine death by the last Adam, who is the beginner of a new human race, by finishing this one, bringing it to death. And when he rose from the dead, he carried us to where we'd never dreamed before, into union with the Father, union with himself, Union then with the Father as He knows union with the Father. And peace with the Father even as Jesus is at peace. With no remembrance of sin or shame. But only the abundance of love and kindness and compassion and joy. Shalom. That, that's, that's what it means. The Creator. The Creator. You see, if you, if you wonder what happened on the cross, you have to ask the question, who is on the cross? It's not just a good man. It's not just a prophet. It's not someone that had an unusual knowledge of God. No, this is God himself, the Creator, who has taken our human in order to embrace the sin of every man and woman and carry it to death. And in resurrection, what does it mean? Well, if you, you resurrect, it means there's nothing to keep you dead. Sin has been wiped out, canceled, gone, finished. That's why Jesus cried in the midst of it all. It is finished. And now the restored creation, the, the recreated creation, so the Creator got inside His broken creation and recreated it by carrying to death and then rising from death, bringing about everything that God love had purpose since before time. I mean, don't you remember what Jesus said when He rose from the dead? You know, in, in um, John's Gospel, chapter 20, I think mean, verse 17, Jesus said to Mary, he said, go to my brethren. Now, that's massive. He said to her, go to my brethren. Uh, and brethren uh, means brothers and sisters. Go to my... What does that mean? He is saying that he and us are the same family. He says, we, we share the same humanity and now you are participating in my life. A life that's overcome death. A life that pulsates in fellowship with the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son together. You're my brothers and sisters. Think on that for a week. Go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend, or I'm going to my Father and your Father. He says we have the same relationship. To God the Father, I'm carrying you there as surely as I, to my God and your God. And, and then that, in, in Luke's gospel, um, it was evening that day, first day of the week, Sunday, the doors were shut. Decide for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them. Now, in our regular Bibles, it, it says, fear not. But in the most original manuscript we have in, in the Aramaic language, um, it, it says, let me, let me read it to you. It says, be at peace. I am the living God. Don't be afraid. Don't let doubt or imagination enter your heart. I am. I wish they'd have included that into our Bible. God himself, the I am, now in human, but a human like we've never seen before, but still our brother. He said, peace be with you. 
be at peace, shalom. That's why the angel said that's why he came. And now, resurrected from the dead, says, I did it. Peace to you. And he goes on to show them his hands. And as it ends, he says, and peace be with you. Or, or 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. You know this one, I'm sure. All these things are from God. God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Your name is in there. He doesn't count your trespasses against He doesn't count your sins and your guilt against you. He has then committed to us this word of reconciliation. We beg you, said Paul, be reconciled, because he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, this word reconciliation, which those verses are all about, Reconciliation, did you know it's an ancient word which means exchange? I, I don't know if, do you remember the corner store? See, that's where I was raised. You can go to the corner store. Uh, and I suppose in Texas it would be called the ranch store, or well, general store, that would be it, the general store. And, and they had those sacks of flour and sacks of this and that and the other. Nothing like a supermarket today. And, and, and they would scoop out from the sacks and they'd put it in a scale. Do you remember those scales? And they had two, two plates on them. And they'd put the, in the one side, they'd pile it up with the grain or the flour. And then on the other side, they'd put the weights and they're balanced. Do you know what that used to be called? Do you remember? It was reconciled. That is this side and that side. It's perfect exchange. Do you realize... And it says, God reconciled us. That is, you see, some people think God had to be reconciled. I read it the other day, some book, where, where, where it says that God was so angry with us. So he, so he couldn't stand the sight of us. But you see, then well, Jesus sneaked here, you see. And, and, and Jesus changed the mind of the Father about us. And he sneaked us in while Father was in a good mood. No, I'm, my emphasis is a little, uh, yeah, but that, that's what people believe. No, God the Father, Son, and Spirit never needed to be reconciled to you. Never. For He loved you with a love that would not give up. We had to be reconciled. Our mind had to be exchanged for the mind of Christ. We had to see God as he revealed himself in Jesus. We had to have a new heart. The heart of Jesus poured into us. That's why Jesus died and rose again. And righteousness, we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, that's a word that has been so drowned by religion. Do you know that word is an Old Testament word which means walking in union, bond of covenant friendship, walking in loving kindness, in our attitude and thoughts and words and actions, walking then in union with God through Jesus Christ, in covenant friendship with God, in our attitude, thoughts, words, and actions. Yes, Jesus is the only one. Jesus is the only human that had righteousness in his walk with God the Father. But then he took us to death. He took our place. There was a perfect exchange. He got all of our sin and brokenness, and he gave us. He, he took his own righteousness and put it into us that we might know that relationship with the Father that Jesus knew and has. That's what it's all about. 
That's what it's all about. We are the new person, the new man. You see, he's, he's the man. And, and within that man is the woman. <laughs> he's us. But he's God who joined us, union with us, in order to totally participate in our history to one with our sin because he has no sin. And he can do it to every one of us because he is our creator and holds us all. He won with us that now we might participate in all that he is in his triumph over sin, the crushing of Satan, and the bringing in of perfect peace, and the putting away of all disharmony, that becomes our history. It's the truth. It's the truth. Jesus says it, John 14, 27. Peace, this same word, shalom. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. That is not something out here that's ever changing, but I'm giving you shalom, my own shalom I'm taking and putting it into you. Which leads into John 15 where he says, that my, my, my joy might be inside of you, and therefore that your joy might be made full. He carried us, every man. That's the meaning of the term world. God so loved the world, every man, every one of you, everyone. He carried mankind but mankind, each with a name, each with a face. He carried us to shalom with God, peace with God, in order that we might participate in all of life, from the office to the home and every relationship we have. We might, we now who have peace with God, participate in the peace of God. Let, let me read to you, and I'm done. Uh, th this is um, the Passion Translation of the New Testament, and I find that it is one of the best I have read in recent years. Let me read to you Romans chapter 5, first verses. Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. And he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us this perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. But that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have joyful confidence because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. That's you. This is not trivia. This is not information that you can now file away. This is not a message that you can say, well, that was a jolly good message, or otherwise. No, this is the Word of God spoken to you. This that I have spoken of tonight is who you are in this one God-man, Jesus Christ, who in himself has carried away your sin and given to you righteousness and shalom, and in himself has carried you into the 
same tranquility and peace that pulsates and dances in the fellowship of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. This is who you are. And I ask you to meditate on that for the rest of this week. And now the blessing of God, who is almighty love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, grant to you the realization of the peace of God that passes human comprehension, that your mind and your heart may be guarded in Christ Jesus. So I bless you. And that's the way it is.